all that to learn and still trust and fight and say, Father in heaven, you're in charge, you're permitting that, this, this is your work, this is your church that's preaching your gospel, this man is the man that taught all of us the way of God, and he's in charge under Christ, and we can honor him and honor you and know you'll take care of it in due time. And that's just the way it has to be. I'll just speak personally now, not to dwell on self, but I don't want to confuse my story with others because I may not have all the facts straight. But I was personally forbidden by Garner Ted Armstrong to contact his father. He got me once in a meeting with others, and then there were two or three other times I heard where he told other evangelists and others in meetings to which I was not even invited, you had better not try to go around me and talk to my father. You had better not tell him any of your ideas about where you think I'm going away in doctrine or administration or anything else. And he said, Rob, he told me personally, if you try to contact my dad, I cannot guarantee your future or anything about your career in this work. And he said it very strongly. Uh, and I just have to say that again, knowing that God is listening, and I'm telling the truth before him. But anyway, I did not try to contact Mr. Armstrong when Garner Ted was still in office or go to him or make some big upset. last night, the news about it, and uh, they were just filling the uh, auditorium, the Hall of Administration, and the Student Center, and holding a religious service all day long. And uh, now word has come that they wanted some directive from me. I knew nothing about this. I had nothing to do with it, and not any of our ministers that I know of did. As a matter of fact, I have found that uh, the leading minister that we left to guard the property in Pasadena, Mr. Ellis Laravia, knew nothing about it. And some telephone calls were coming to me the night before, and people were a little confused, and they wanted to know if it was from me. And I just had to say, I don't know anything about it. But they're looking for some guidance from me. My wife's mother was there, and she said, well, I, the next time I call you, it may have to be when I'm in jail. And she said, if I have to go to jail, I'm willing. I want to say to you, brethren, and to all of the people in Pasadena, that the people of God have always been willing to suffer whatever they have to do for the living God. And I tell you, this has drawn us together. We are fighting this battle for all churches, for all religions. We are fighting it for freedom of press and freedom of religion, for freedom of, uh, uh, of speech and freedom of assembly. And all of these things are being now threatened by uh, certain judges, uh, ex-judges, and all I can say is this, what the Bible teaches us, what God teaches us through the Bible, is that we are to be subject to the powers that be of the government of man, but being subject does not always mean obey. When it comes to the difference between God and man, we are to obey God rather than man. But yet we will be subject to man if they throw us in prison. I have often thought the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, the other apostles, were always thrown into, were, not always, but they were thrown into prison. And the Apostle uh, Peter a number of times, at least I think I can think of three times. And uh, I have wondered if we aren't going to have some of that today. I think the biggest persecution on the Church of God will come a little later, when we get to the era of the Laodicean era. Nevertheless, it is starting now, and this thing is big. And it's in all of the newspapers all over the world. 
and if they lay hands on women and mothers and little children and take them off to jail, I want to tell you that will be in every newspaper all over this world. I say to you people in Pasadena, be subject to the law, but obey God rather than man. The living God is fighting this battle for us and against forces that are not God's forces. So I go on record as saying that. Now, we are a law-abiding people. We are subject to the law. We are patriotic. We are loyal. We're very loyal for our country, and we love our country. But unfortunately, we're living in a world where there is a great deal of evil. And I tell you, when six men who are dissidents and who only hate the work of God and want to destroy it, and who are ex-members of the church can come together and allege certain things and bring certain false charges. It's precisely the same thing as in the days of Jesus Christ. When people brought false charges, false charges against Christ, he was on trial for his life before Pontius Pilate. And Pilate asked him, what have you done? He says, I find no evil in this man. I, there's no, no evidence of anything. And it's exactly that way today. They have not one shred of evidence. They are looking over our books and they haven't found anything against us because there isn't anything against us. We have done no evil. We are only doing what the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the living Christ, has commissioned us to do. And I say to you, by the authority of Jesus Christ, we shall go on doing it no matter what happens. And if we have to begin to suffer the persecution of being thrown in prison, I will be the first to be ready to go. If they want to throw 86-year-old uh, people into prison, if they want to throw women and little bit of children that are there into prison, I think they're ready to go. Now I say to you, and to you in Pasadena, in every way, be subject to not obeying, but being subject to the law. And sometimes we have to obey God rather than man and then be subject to whatever punishment they want to put on us. And we are willing to suffer for the cause of the living Jesus Christ. And I tell you, when even a state is fighting against the living God, it's like the old Goliath, the giant, the big, he says that this, this giant is fighting against the living God. And David does came out on top, and the, the great giant Goliath fell down dead. And I tell you, God is fighting this battle for us, and God is stronger than man, and stronger than the powers of man. Never forget that. So I think that everybody will know what to do. I have nothing to do with this, but we should and we will in every way fight to protect the name and the property of the living God and the property that is needed in his name and when his name is even on the very building of the finest auditorium in the world on that campus, the Ambassador Auditorium. God's name is there in gold letters. And we're going to protect what is God. And God Almighty is with us. And that is a power greater than the power of man. I, I think that is enough of that now. I'm turning this meeting here over to Dr. Meredith, and uh, I may want to butt in once in a while, but otherwise, Dr. Meredith and any other ministers uh, uh, will be speaking to you most of the morning. Dr. Meredith. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Greetings to all of you. I've been very grateful to see so many of you friends, and I think I can truthfully say loved ones from many parts of the earth in the last few days coming out to Pasadena and now back here to Tucson. I have had the privilege of being with so many of you in different places before, you know, having been, of course, in America and around the United States churches many, many years, and then spending four years of my adult life in Brickett Wood, or in Britain, I should say, and two and a half years recently right at Brickett Wood, and I got to know... Uh, of course, a lot of the Aussies and the Kiwis and the Canadians and all the rest over there. So when I went to Australia about two and a half years ago for the feast, well, it almost felt like a homecoming. I got to see Rod Dean and Rod King and Rod McQueen and Rod Matthews, and I felt right at home. They were all down there. 
I guess Rod is one of the most popular names in Australia. They usually call them Rodney is the full name down there, rather than Roderick. But uh, anyway, it's still Rod. And of course, uh, the Bible says we're to rule with the rod of iron, so all of us uh, enjoyed that. We had a lot of fun with that when I first came to Brickett Wood. I do appreciate the warmth and the loyalty, though, that a lot of you have already shown, and I know that you have shown Mr. Armstrong so much in giving him an ovation, really, when he comes out here each morning. And I think that's tremendous, and I know that that is something in which God is well pleased. I really do. Uh, I'd like to say also that a lot of you know that I have been associated with, in the 1950s and 60s, being uh, strict and uh, being, uh, let's say, authoritarian or this or that. And I know that rumor has been spread far and wide. And I'd like to say this, that regardless, of course, as many have told me, the whole work was more that way at that time, that God allowed me to go through a whole lot of traumas in my own life. Where I came down from one to another to another to another trauma after another until finally my wife was taken. And it helped me to come to a place where I really feel, brethren, and I mean this, that I was willing to do whatever God wanted in whatever way and whatever configuration of any kind whatsoever in the work and stay in God's work and ask God to help me work on that particular problem. And I have hoped and prayed that God would help me work on it, change, mellow, mature, and have more empathy and consideration and thought for the plans and the hopes and the dreams and the feelings of those that I worked with than I had ever had, or I hope that the most people had, because we can all mature in those ways through God's Spirit. And I certainly do intend to show you that in the months and the years that lie ahead with all my heart, and I know I'll have God's help in that, and I'm sure I'll have your support in that in whatever configuration I am. And I really mean that, and I hope you will help me in that way. Yet. I've come in in a time of battle, and I would like to have come into this office if I were ever to come into this office or any similar office again in a time of peace, where Mr. Armstrong, of course, Mr. Armstrong would too, where we could all just sit around and enjoy peace and tranquility and have a kind of feast of tabernacle spirit and say, how are you, and, and everything's great, and love one another, but it isn't that way. We're in a time of the greatest trial and the greatest war, actually, that the Church of God in our era has probably ever had. Mr. Armstrong had to fight some other wars of a similar nature all alone when the church was much smaller and he was being attacked by fires and evil and sin, who was well named, and men like that. But I even got to know up in Oregon years ago. But as far as the big massive assault of the nature that we're seeing today, this certainly is the greatest trial of God's church in a long, long time and the greatest trial any of us have ever, ever known. So I'm sure that all of you can understand that if some of us have to act a little bit more quickly, we may get to see you a little bit less. We may have to act a little bit more decisively. You know, in your time of war, you can't sit around rubbing your hands and saying, well, let's wait till the enemies, you know, kill half of us before making up our minds what to do. You just can't do that. But once this war has settled down, and we're going to try to act as patiently and lovingly and get all the facts even during this time, I'll guarantee you that with all my heart. But after this time, it'll be even more peaceful and even more loving and so on. And I'm sure you all understand. And I feel because of the present distress, as the Apostle Paul used this terminology back in the book of Luke, we're certainly in the present distress of a different nature, but because of that, several have mentioned to me that one of the two biggest problems that is seething in the minds of many of the ministers right now, and perhaps many of your wives, because of things that have been said, is the situation of recent days and how it came about. And so I feel that the most important thing, although I'd like to go into the Bible, I'd like to go into doctrine, I'd like to go into a lot of different areas of, of plans for the future and growth in the work, and I will try to go into some of those things later if we have time. But the most important single thing that I can do is kind of show you a little bit of the history of recent years and recent months that have led up to this present trial and help you understand it. And I will just say what I say before God, as I think you all know we speak before him anyway, but I want to put it that way. I do not believe that we're keep just the spirit of the law. I believe we're to keep the letter of the law and the spirit of the law, which magnifies it and makes it all the more binding. And so if I lie and deliberately lie to you this morning, I shall not be in God's kingdom. I'm forfeiting my eternal life. And a lot of you have heard that I've been this or been that, but I don't think any of you have heard that I've been a politician or that I've been a yes man. In fact, I sometimes was so much of a no man to Mr. Armstrong in the past in the sense of bringing up this or that or something else, I guess. One other man who's not with us and I used to say, well, yes, but, on various things, because we were very open with Mr. Armstrong. We talked to him, a son to a father, and he in turn talked to us as fathers to a son. 
in any way. <laughs> I know my father used to have to speak to me that way once in a while when I was growing up. And he said, Roddy, he said, you can say that that's got to go. And uh, so we had these situations. But I want to explain about my recent appointment and about the recent upset in pastoral administration and, of course, now in the whole work. But before I do, brethren, I want to say this one thing. I'm not going to be preaching you a sermon this morning, but I think I would be remiss if I didn't at least bring our attention to one or two scriptures, and I mean just two as I have at this particular time. And one is something that, well, all these things are something you've taught, truths that you've all taught. I'm sure every one of you has taught these, and yet somehow we, we forget them when it comes at it from a different angle, so these problems come in a different direction. We forget these basic things so quickly. For the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1, 22, said that God has put all things under Christ's feet and gave him, Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. And brethren, we've seen that in other situations, and we've seen time and time again, and I have for back nearly 30 years now, 29 and a half years since my first student days in Ambassador College, of working with this man on my left, whom I've been closer to for the last 29 and a half years, and my own physical father, and because he died 15 and a half years anyway, and we were separated by 2,000 miles, even when he was yet alive, and the trials we've all gone through together in God's work. So we've seen how something that looks really bad does turn out later for good. And God does guide, and God does lead, and God does inspire, and God does cause all things to work together for good for those of us who love God and, and call, are called according to his purpose. And God tells us if we love him, keep his commandments. And this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And we are a commandment-keeping church. And so for those of us in the church who believe in the commandments and keep the commandments, and I have to qualify it that way because some have gone another way, frankly, even in our own midst, as most of you understand. But for those of us who are doing that, God does cause all things to work together for good. And Christ has been made head over all things to the church, not just some things. Christ has made head over the church to guide Mr. Armstrong as the apostle today. Christ has made head over the church to guide events overall. He permits us to make mistakes, yes, and we've seen that. And I've come to recognize that Christ rules us or guides us with a looser leash, I might put it that way, than we once thought, where we thought Christ is guiding this and that and our exact everything. And he doesn't do that. He allows us to make mistakes. And yet, in the big overall sense, God, Christ is responsible to guide things in Mr. Armstrong's area, in pastoral administration, in publishing and editorial, in media, in the business area of the work. He is responsible. He is Christ. He's alive. He is not dead. And we've got to understand that. And he's the head over all things to the church. Now, back in Colossians, of course, the same thing where it talks about Christ, the firstborn of every creature, in Colossians 1, 15, and then verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the first the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So Christ is the head of the church, which is Christ's body. And that's what we are, all of us together, are his arms and legs and hands and feet and, and toes and all the rest of it. And he's working through us, and he's guiding us, and he is the head of all of us together as a team. And he has all power and all might and all knowledge. And we really do have to see that Christ is in charge. And perhaps Christ himself has let a lot of things happen the last few years. Once we really got going and we had the growth of the 50s, the great soaring growth, and even the unity of the 1960s, then Christ allowed tests to come on this church age of perhaps a different nature than in past ages because even our physical health might not permit a lot of us in our degenerate state to be thrown in prison for months at a time and jerked up and beat with the cat and nine tails with the blood pouring off our backs. I don't know if all of us could take it and recuperate it in the way the Apostle Paul did. Some of us may yet have to go to jail, of course, but maybe in a different type of situation and not nearly as long and all the rest of it. But I'm just saying Christ gave us a different type of test. And he's allowed men to come in from the outside. And as the Apostle Paul warned the elders of Ephesus, he told and said, I know that after my departure, some shall rise up among you, leading men astray. And he's allowed that to happen, to test the church in a different sort of way. 
rather than all the great big press and the big radio TV studio and imperial schools absorbing more and more people. More people came out for jobs and they got on the payroll and we were bigger and bigger. All of a sudden God said, well, that's fine, but you got bigger and bigger and you got more liberal, you watered down my law, and now I'm going to test you from the inside to see where you really stand with me and with my law and with the words that are written in this book and whether you really follow them. And Christ has allowed these things to happen, no doubt, partly for that purpose. And so all these things do have a purpose. And I hope we don't ever forget that Christ is the living head of the church of God and he has not gone way off. He is alive. And we're going to see that more and more, brethren, in the months and years that are ahead. I think all of you know, and I don't want to dwell on that because people at headquarters have heard us mention a few times, but Mr. Raymond McNair and Dr. Hay and I, Mr. Partian, and other leading ministers who worked faithfully with Mr. Armstrong, we may not have been as perfect, we may not have been as handsome, we may not have been as smart, we may not have had the personality or this or that as some others. But some of us have worked with Mr. Armstrong virtually all of our adult lives. And we've never been associated with any plot of the many plots that came up or people who were dissidents in the 1950s or the 1960s or the early 1970s or the middle 1970s. We've just been loyal to him and to God's word. But because of circumstances and the way the work was going, we were put down and shelved and put aside, and we had to bear it patiently. And I was congratulated by some, or by several, really, that we had come to realize we're very liberal. They even congratulated Mr. McNair and me on being willing to bear it patiently. And they said, well, that really shows you have a good attitude. I remember them telling me that. I could name their names, but I, I won't. I don't want to embarrass because some are still here, and of course some are gone. Several mentioned that. And so I hope that in a different way, if their heart is right, and if they're willing to change, that they may be willing to bear it patiently if they have to accept a little bit to one side for a while. But it will not be for a malice. It will be because we have all got to get back to the law of God and the way of God. But the point is, many of them were not willing to bear it patiently even for one day or for one week. And when they're put down, they just say, I can't take this. And they just take right off and leave. They threaten to resign. They threaten to bow up. They threaten to rebel. And they're not willing to take it. Many individuals of that sort, even for one week or one month, as you know, starting with the very highest next to Mr. Armstrong, right on down, doing the very things they said they would never do at any time. They were not willing to be humble. They were not willing to be corrected. They were not willing to step aside for a while and bear it patiently. I hope all of us will be willing to do that, though, from time to time in God's work. I know very well I may need to again. I've done it before. I can do it again. But I just want to say that's a lesson we've all got to learn and still trust in Christ and say, Father in heaven, you're in charge. You're permitting that. this. This is your work. This is your church that's preaching your gospel. This man is the man that taught all of us the way of God, and he's in charge under Christ, and we can honor him and honor you, and know you'll take care of it in due time. And that's just the way it has to be. I'll just speak personally now, not to dwell on self, but I don't want to confuse my story with others because I may not have all the facts straight. But I was personally forbidden by Garner Ted Armstrong to contact his father. He got me once in a meeting with others, and then there were two or three other times I heard where he told other evangelists and others in meetings to which I was not even invited you had better not try to go around me and talk to my father. You had better not tell him any of your ideas about where you think I'm going away in doctrine or administration or anything else. And he said, Rod, he told me personally, if you try to contact my dad, I cannot guarantee your future or anything about your career in this work. And he said it very strongly. Uh, and I just have to say that again, knowing that God is listening and I'm telling the truth before him. But anyway... I did not try to contact Mr. Armstrong when Garner Ted was still in office or go to him or make some big upset. I was only able to talk to him briefly once or twice during that time, once at Mr. Raymond McNair's wedding. And I went over to a personal reception after the wedding back in 1977 and uh, knowing or, or hearing that it was going to be kind of a family reception over at Raymond's apartment. And there was Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong and we did get to talking and he brought up a number of the problems that he already knew about and I was astonished in one way how much he did know, because, you know, everyone says, oh, Mr. Armstrong doesn't know anything. He's all cut off. And I found he did know a lot. I really did. And I had not been the one telling him, and I'm sure he can tell you that, because I hadn't even seen him for about one solid year before that time, as far as being able to talk to him more than just to say hello for uh, 10 seconds or something of that sort. But I did not do that. I did not plot at any time or in any way to get back over 
pastoral administration. I told God in my own prayers, Father, you've let me be second vice president, superintendent of ministers, and this and that for those many, many years, where they overlapped those jobs for about a 15-year period. But now I've come down where I'm a local pastor, was given a church of 135 people in the ghetto area of Los Angeles, and was allowed to teach one or two classes at night at first, and then later in the day. And that was it. And I was willing to do that and carry on with that, and God knows that. But I did not even ask God in prayer to do that. I just said, Father, if you want me to get more of my time or talent or experience later, it's up to you. And I don't know where. And brethren, I did not know where either. I mean that. I honestly did not know where God might use me. I thought, well, I might be an active senior editor or an active uh, sort of uh, advisor to uh, uh, Wayne Cole first when I came back from Britain. I thought he might use me that way. Or later, Ron Bart. Uh, might use me because I'd had so much experience with the field men. And I just thought there might be something like that. I thought at one point maybe I'll be an area coordinator or something. I just didn't know. and uh, But I just asked God to work it out, and uh, that's the way. Well, then finally, uh, back last May the 10th, as Mr. Armstrong, I'm sure, will remember, when Ted was banished for the first time for trying to take over the work and all the other things he was doing, and I won't go into that, but he was supposed to be temporarily out, suspended, or whatever, from his job. And the thought was that might be it permanently. At that time, finally, within him out of office, I felt uh, absolutely duty-bound to call Mr. Armstrong because I realized I hadn't contacted him or talked to him for nearly a year. And I thought, here he is over in Tucson. I've been one of his lieutenants for all these years. And I knew that Raymond had felt the same way and others. But finally, I went home on a private line, knowing even concerned about our lines being tapped there. And I called him on a private line, and I said, Mr. Armstrong, this is Rod. And, and, and I know that Ted is out, and I heard he's talking against you back at Big Sandy, and there's danger he may start a kind of a coup to take over the work. And I just want you to know that Raymond and Herman and, and D. Barr and I, and then I said, I, I think I just threw in. Well, Danny Luker, I know, I know you know he's loyal to, and he's right up the road. And a lot of us feel that way, and we'd like to help you if we can. If there's something you want us to do to make some kind of a special... Uh, uh, barnstorming tours to rally the churches or help out or write letters of support or anything like that, please let us know. And I haven't been able to see you now for a month, and I just want you to know that but we're for you. And I'm sure you remember that. And I, I didn't say, I want back over a job, or I want you to do this or that. I didn't say any of those words whatsoever in that phone conversation or when we went to see him. I did not say, well, Mr. Armstrong, we want to come over and see you right now. I just said, I hope we can see you again sometime and we can help you. And then he said, well, now, Rod, he says, I'm coming out that very weekend. Well, I didn't know that, but he was planning to come out that very weekend. This was on a Tuesday night. And he said, and then he said I'll, I'll see you then. And then he started to say, well, now, uh, wait a minute. Uh, I'm supposed to see Ray Wright, and I'm supposed to see this and that and all these meetings Friday. I've got to take the Bible study, and then I've got to take the service early the next day because they were going to have the service move back from 2.30 until 1 that Sabbath so it could be piped back to Big Sandy you see, two hours later in a time zone, and they could, they could hear it at 3 o'clock there, and it wouldn't be too late for them. And so they said, I really won't have much time, because I need to rest and prepare in between one message and another. And then the doctors and nurses have told me, I better not talk to people too much after that, because this will be the biggest single strain I put on my system since the heart failure last August. And he said, I better not try to stay and have lots of talks and meetings, then I'll be flying right back to Tucson, and that's already scheduled. He said, maybe you'd better come over here, and I said, you come over Thursday. I said, well, I think so. This was already Tuesday afternoon or evening. And uh, then he said, well, no, uh, Mr. Rader now has got this businessman or TV man. I forget who it was coming. And he said, well, can you come to, uh, Wednesday? He said, well, now, wait a minute. That's tomorrow. I remember you saying it just that way. I didn't plan to come tomorrow or any other time. But I said, well, we'll sure try. And I think I can get Raymond because Raymond was then sent way back, you know, Shanghai, frankly, the man who had been Mr. Loyalty over God's work for 15 years in Britain and always had the people all over Britain and all over Europe open every service, asking God's blessing on Mr. Armstrong and Mr. Garner Ted Armstrong. And he always did both of them, just like that. Mr. Hunting was the one who told me, he said, said Mr. McNair, they're just the same. And just always, Mr. Armstrong, Mr. Garner Ted Armstrong, are just like, I think he said, a broken record. You know what I mean, but in the right way. It was just the two of them. He was always being loyal to the both of them, the both of them, both of them. And even though he got put down for that, nevertheless, he's been loyal and built God's work in a very fine work in Britain for 15 years, and his reward was being sent back over a little church also, one little church in uh, in the Ozarks, where he wouldn't cause any trouble. 
quote unquote. But anyway, I said, I think I can get Raymond, but I don't know. He's way back there, but I got him first. I went right to uh, uh, try to call him first and let him know. I called Mr. and he was able to fly out through the night. I got Mr. Party in. Dr. Hay was unavailable, but uh, I did get uh, uh, Mr. Lucas in. I think I called him last of all, and he said, yes, he could drive down and meet us there. And some of us could have a chat with Mr. Armstrong, encourage him, and also encourage ourselves with what was happening and being able to see the chief again after such a long time. So uh, that's how we got down there. I remember Mr. Parting saying quite heatedly that he did not want us to go over there because we all knew that there had been a great liberal, frankly, movement and doctrine and the thing that resulted in this SCP. But he said, I, Rod, I don't want us to go over there and talk about people or indulge in any kind of character assassination. He says, we'll just come back on it and probably there aren't going to be any changes made anyway, and uh, they'll just get it, and so on, and that's just not the Christian thing to do anyway. And I said, well, that's right, and we talked with Raymond, and of course he agreed, and, and uh, very, very much, and Dennis, and we didn't. We just went over to Mr. Armstrong's house to show loyalty and to talk to him. We discussed the problem with GTA and with the work in general. He began to bring up the doctrine and how that had begun to go bad because that was very paramount in his mind and the problems of Ambassador College and so on. And then we did mention, well, have you heard of this thing that's come up? I assumed he did because it was announced that he did about the STP. And he said, no. He said, what is that? I said, STP. And he said, well, isn't that something you put in your motor oil? <laughs> and, uh, well, we got into it. Now, some, frankly, have lied, and they said Mr. Armstrong knew all about the STP. And some of you ministers right here have heard those lies, and I guess you've got to decide who to believe. But I did question him further, because I'd heard those stories, and he said, well, he said, I was shown a little abbreviated sort of eight-page paper or something, of which they admitted was a very abbreviated version of a, of a paper on healing that they were working on. And he said, well, I want to read more about that later and understand it. And he said, I might have been shown part of one other paper. But he said, as far as a great big notebook and dozens of articles to be published and sent to every minister on earth, I never heard of such a thing. Yeah, I, uh, uh, may I interrupt here just a second on that, because I can supply something that uh, uh, Dr. Meredith doesn't even know. At uh, that time, which I remember, and I, I don't remember there was much as eight or ten sheets of paper, uh, there was something on healing. And, of course, Garner Ted was there, and I said, look, I have come to the conclusion on this matter of healing of exactly what you have all read now in uh, the Good News uh, magazine, that uh, Jesus said, according to your faith, be it unto you, so far as healing is concerned. And in some places, uh, Christ's healings were entirely by Jesus' own faith. But in some cases, it was the face of the one healed, like the woman who touched his garments that had been plagued with doctors for uh, ten years, and they'd taken all of her money, and, and yet she had not gotten better, but rather worse. And uh, he said to her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole, in that case. But I said, It is a matter of faith. And I said, Some of our people don't have that kind of faith. It's just like some people, uh, as uh, uh, Paul was writing, uh, did not have the faith to eat uh, certain kinds of meat. And uh, we were told that we shouldn't keep them out because of that or judge them. Now, we don't, we don't receive the full amount that is available to us of the Holy Spirit when we're first converted. We have to grow in grace and in knowledge. And in the faith, where does faith come from? If you notice the Bible, it's not our faith in Christ that we believe in Christ. It is Christ's faith put into us by the Holy Spirit, the very faith that Christ used in healing the sick and all the miracles that he did. That faith is one of the things the Holy Spirit does put in us, and it comes straight from God and from Christ. And I said, when some of our people do not have faith in that, and they have always been brought up to... Uh, uh, have more or less faith in doctors and medicines and things of that kind, that uh, we should not, there is the principle in the Bible, we should not judge them because they lack that faith 
and I am the one I'm no longer willing to take that away from them and leave nothing with them. They don't have the faith to be healed. And said, well, then that's fine, Dad. If they, uh, I, I don't think we need to discuss it any further. And that was all that was said about it at that time. I didn't read that paper. I didn't know there was any uh, uh, systematic theology project coming at all. I didn't know anything about it, and that it was going to cover any other subject. Nothing of that kind was given to me, and as God is my judge, I did not know. And those that said I did were lying. I hope you can believe that. I think some of you won't believe me even now. Maybe you'd rather believe my son, but my son has said untrue when he said that. And he managed, he said, Dad, no, uh, nothing in respect to doctrine of any kind is going to be brought up in this conference. And uh, he knew that uh, I had some appointments overseas in Europe. And so I was there, as you men will remember, uh, the morning, the first morning of the uh, uh, conference a year ago, just a little over a year ago now, about a year and one or two weeks. And uh, at that morning, uh, we uh, ordained to evangelist rank uh, Mr. Uh, uh, now, when it comes to remembering names, they, they're right on my tongue, they won't come out. But, uh, well, why can't I think of it? Our man who was in uh, uh, Canada all these years and became the greatest uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, booster well, Dean, Wilson, Canada, Dean, Wilson, uh, Dean Wilson. Dean Wilson. Yeah, Dean Wilson. And uh, we're talking about him this morning. Ron Kelly. Ron, uh, Kelly. And uh, they haven't been made. Uh, it was all good. I couldn't even think of that. You know, someday a uh, census taker is going to come to our front door and he's going to say, uh, oh, What is your name? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember. I can't think of it. My own name won't come to me. Well, anyway, I did not know anything about it. And I just wanted to explain that one thing. And uh, But there was not one word said to me about any project. And uh, Dr. Kuhn was uh, the one who wrote practically all, if not all, of that project. They wanted it in a scholarly form, and uh, they wanted to water down religion and throw Christ out of it and God out of it and just, just get them and their truth and the Bible out the window and go secular. And that's why some people have been put out of this church. I, and I think that's how I have to write this minute. You did. Well, that's helpful. We begin to get the whole picture, and I wish we could, you know, take... Uh, five meetings and give you the whole picture, but we really don't have time for that, and I'm sure you understand it. I just want to give you an overview, though, of what uh, uh, has been going on. Anyway, we did discuss the STP, and we showed him a copy of it, and he'd never seen such a thing, never heard of such a thing as that, and any manner, shape, or form being done, or let alone being sent out to the whole ministry, was very concerned about it. And in our meeting over there, uh, again, some began to deliberately, and I'm going to go back or come to this later, but let me just say ahead of time, brethren, and I mean this again, before my God, there were rumors that were spread and spread and spread and have been spread, especially in the last year, unbelievable rumors of every single type about Mr. Armstrong, about Mr. Rader, about Mr. McNair and me, and everyone, frankly, when you trace it down, who might be associated with those who believed the law. I'm just going to say it's just that simple. There are those who believe the law, and those who don't believe the law, or they want to water down God's law. They want to water down the commandments. They want to water down that way of life. And when you put it all together, you begin to get a picture. But at any rate, uh, crazy rumors are beginning to come out even after our visit to Tucson. And I had reports from several friends that area coordinators and others were saying around the United States, that uh, Raymond and Rod and Dee Barr and Benny and whoever all they mentioned of us had gone back to Tucson to get our old jobs back. Or we'd gone back to assassinate Robert Kuhn or Wayne Cole. Well, Mr. Armstrong is, is sitting here. We did not discuss those men. We did not assassinate character. I don't even know if Wayne Cole's name was mentioned. We mentioned Robert Kuhn after Mr. Armstrong commanded us about three times. And I was balking on it. Well, who put this out? And I kept saying, Ted did. Well, who put, I know Ted did, but he, I know he has people do those things. Now, who did it? 
And I finally said, well, Robert Kim was the chief of staff, but there was a whole group of men doing it. Then we mentioned Robert. But we never went to get Robert at all. I used to love Robert and still do as a human being very much. I spent hundreds of hours with him, took him and his wife out. I baptized him. I been around him, a very likable, friendly person. But because of his past educational orientation, yes, and all the rest of it, why, his orientation toward the law and toward the Bible changed, as did a number of these other men, very violently. But that was not our purpose in that visit. You wish to comment on that, Mr. Turner? Perhaps you did. You wish to comment on that, but you're going to comment on that. No, I, I just say that you had nothing to do with that. And uh, uh, I want to say this right now, uh, Dr. Meredith and uh, Raymond McNair and these fellows had absolutely nothing to do with the position that I have placed them in now. In no manner did they lobby for it or make any effort for it. They were humble and were willing to stay wherever they were put. As God is my judge, that is the truth. I am tired of this thing of people lobbying to get a high position. There was a man in England that was lobbying to try to get to be the head of the church, and I didn't know it. I loved him. I liked him. Every time I was over there, he wanted to go with me wherever I went, whether it was Jerusalem or even down to London for lunch. And uh, he's a man who said, Mr. Armstrong, if I ever disagreed with you on one single point, I would keep my mouth shut about it, and I would never mention it to a one, but I would, uh, at the first opportunity, I would bring it to you. And if... Uh, I laid it before you, and you could see that I was right, and, and so you agreed and changed the doctrine. Fine, then, then I could speak about it. But if not, I would still keep my mouth shut unless you convinced me, and I, I believe you were right. But I would never come out and say anything against it. And that man is out of the church today because he violated that very thing and, without, and, and began trying to even tell people they could work on the Sabbath. They could do anything, they could keep a job on the Sabbath, do anything they wanted, water down and completely change the truth, the law of God, and the doctrines of God in the Bible. And, uh, uh, however, I think there's some extenuating circumstances. This was a man I loved very, very much. I spent a great deal of time with him. I liked to be with him. I'm not sure he liked to be with me. And uh, I would hate to think it was all just for a purpose. And uh, But he lost a very lovely wife. And I think the loss of his wife is what uh, really got to him. And uh, so he was hardly himself again. And I have heard of someone who talked to him on the telephone just within the last uh, week or ten days. And uh, I'm ho I hope that he's getting over some of that. And... Maybe he can be brought back into the church again, but he seems to want to come back in the church on a very hot position. And, of course, under the circumstances, that could not be now. Uh, Dr. Meredith, when he was put down wrongfully, he didn't murmur. He took it gracefully. And I noticed that when he was sent over to uh, take Mr. McNair's place, I believe it was, at Brickenwood in England, that when I came over, these others rushed up first. Mr. Meredith hung in the background. Others came up to put their arms around me, and of course we can always greet one another with a bear hug. And uh, uh, Dr. Meredith uh, didn't try to, uh, he was there, but he was not trying to just get ahead of the rest of them and get up to me. I want to say that, and uh, I want you all to know that. Thank you, sir. I'd like to say also the rumor began to come out after our Tucson visit, and since then, with the reappointment of Mr. McNair and me and Ambassador College, and more in the recent change, there have been a lot of rumors spread also that we, the right-wing, reactionary, Nazi, jackboot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> group, are, are going to go back. We're going to take the church back to our old stand on divorce and remarriage, Pentecost, makeup, and so on, so on, so on, and so on could be further from the truth. We are not going to do that at all. Mr. Armstrong, again, will re well remember, and everyone at Pasadena who was in on it will remember, liberal and conservative, because Robert Kuhn told me this himself, the number one man 
who came to Mr. Armstrong, finally someone coming with a whole truth about it, and in a humble and a patient attitude about it, instead of a smart, aleck, feisty, rebellious attitude, Mr. Raymond Manair came to Mr. Armstrong in the right attitude about Pentecost, and he had truths that Ernest Martin did not have, and never did have, and they still not have, for all. Mr. Armstrong conveyed those facts to him and get Pentecost changed. And do you think that Raymond Manair got it changed and now he's going to jump right back again? Well, if you know that man, he's one of the most steady men in the whole work of God. He doesn't change around like that. So he and I accepted that immediately. We're very glad to have that change. And on DNR, Mr. Manair changed on that reasonably fast, but not too fast. He had some questions. I had some questions for a few months, frankly, and we conveyed them to Mr. Armstrong. The first paper that came out was not technically accurate at all, and because of those inaccuracies and the fact that we had been taught for many years, and I had taught, and all of us had taught, what God has bound together, let not man put his under. You know, they just rang in my mind. I thought, I'm not going to compromise, and I will not compromise with God's law either, because Mr. Armstrong has taught me that, and God has taught me that. But then I find, found finally I did not have to compromise, and we do understand that the correct manner now, and I'm very grateful for that, and very grateful to God not to have to go back to telling these young couples, well, you've got to split up, so we have no desire to change back on that, or make up either, for that matter. Yes. Just a little input there. I'd like to just put a little in there uh, about uh, the uh, uh, day of Pentecost. Uh, I never did accept uh, the arguments of, uh, again, I can't remember names. Uh, Ernest Martin, and, and I don't now, but uh, it was this, it was Raymond McNair who brought to me the fact that every place, the Hebrew word that is translated in Leviticus 23 uh, as uh, you know, all in one verse twice, uh, from the morrow after the Sabbath, uh, that the uh, word that is translated into the English word from Everywhere else that that, that uh, Hebrew word was used, anywhere else in the Bible, it was always translated into the, into the English word on. And still that wasn't enough to convince me. Because 52 years ago, I have researched in every translation uh, of the Bible that existed at that time. And everyone said count from a Sunday. 52 days from a Sunday. Now, if I'm going to count 52 from Sunday, one day from Sunday is not still Sunday, it is Monday. And it still is, and I still stand on that. But when he said everywhere it, it, it is on instead of from, then I began to wonder. Now, I called a Jewish woman in Israel, long distance clear over into Israel, at a kibbutz, who is teaching Hebrew... Uh, and, uh, that is the Bible in Hebrew. And I had her, I just said, look, I want you to get your Hebrew Bible and tell me uh, 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 how to count. What day does it come out, uh, counting the 50 days? She said, well, it comes out on Sunday. I said, are you sure? Which day do you count first? And she said, well, uh, the first day to count is a Sunday. And so it comes out on Sunday. Well, I still wasn't convinced. And then... I had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, oh, Any time I want to say a man's name, it won't come to me. Uh, huh? oh, Dr. Dorothy. Uh, we we looked up to see if there were uh, some uh, scholars of the uh, RSV, the Revised Standard Translation. And uh, we found one of them, and they got him on the cell phone, and I talked to him. And uh, he says, no, you count Sunday as number one. I said, you can't do that. I said, one day from Sunday is not Sunday. And finally, he agreed. He said, well, Mr. Armstrong, he says, Hebrew people, when they come to English, they will use the word from. And, but he says, I can see that you don't, it doesn't really mean that in English. He said, no, I am... The chairman of a committee to revise that revised standard, and that's coming out now in about another year or two. And uh, really, it, it may be even more accurate than the uh, King James Version. I use the King James mostly because that's what everybody's familiar with, and they all have it, and they understand it better. But in some ways, I think the revised standard is even more accurate. And... Uh, 
Then we called another man from him. We got the name of another man who was on that committee and uh, had a long hassle with him on the telephone, and finally he agreed. But the first man said, I am chairman of the committee to revise the revised standards. And he said, Mr. Armstrong, I will see that it is stated uh, uh, commencing on or beginning on or beginning with a Sunday. You count 50 days. Now, if it had been that way, I, I, 52 years ago, I would have had it correct. And it was just exactly 40 years that God let it go that way. Now, I'm going to show you something about that this afternoon, when uh, uh, I am sure that God bound that on earth and in heaven for 40 years, and that we, in God's sight, were keeping the right day for 40 years. But God could have brought that to me 52 years ago. And I would have said it on Sunday. And as soon as I had proof, as soon as I had evidence, my mind was open, I did change it. And I will not change without proof. But I will always change whenever it is proved that I have been wrong. And I have proved that now. It's the same way. I don't need to go into that now. But it is the same way on the matter of of DNR. It came about something we had never seen, had never considered. Ernest Martin didn't supply any of the, of the arguments uh, that were acceptable in any way at all. And uh, uh, however, there was something that we found that none of us had understood or seen before. And so uh, we have, but I want to say that that doctrine is being overrun and taken advantage of today uh, very greatly. Well, we're just going clear overboard. You get an inch and we want to take a mile. And uh, the people are being divorced and remarried in a way that they shouldn't. And we're going to tighten up on that in the church. But we want to be wherever Christ is. The living Christ is the head of this church, as Dr. Meredith has just said. And he does direct me. But my mind is always open. I'm going to have something to say about these things this afternoon. Thank you. Why, another part of the uh, picture that I think is misunderstood is that uh, some have said, and again it's widely rumored among many of you, that uh, Stan Rader schemed uh, to get rid of Wayne and get me put in. Now, Stan and I both have had a good laugh about that because, uh, frankly, uh, Stan, up until very recently, uh, liked Wayne and had more confidence in Wayne than he did me. He had heard the complete... Yeah. He'd heard the complete uh, black, you know, blackening job, as others have told me, that had been done on me for years by Ted, and even uh, Steve Martin, who was very close to Wayne, and uh, maybe here this afternoon, but Steve Martin has told me, many others, even of their group, have told me that no one was blackened more during those years than I was, by a constant barrage of negativisms about my approach, my personality, everything that could possibly be brought up was brought up year after year after year, and of course many did begin to believe that because if you say something often enough, as, as Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, began to say, if you, you, you uh, say something big enough and loud enough and often enough, the bigger and the louder the lie, then the more likely people are to believe it. And uh, so, but anyway, Stan and I even had a little uh, set to a few months ago, which Mr. Armstrong knows about, and maybe you didn't realize, I'm not bringing something out hidden here, Mr. Armstrong, Stan actually commented on this himself before the brethren in Pasadena just recently with many of you ministers sitting there. But uh, he had been sort of programmed against me, and he'd heard that I was suspicious of him, which I was. <laughs> See? And I'll come to that later, which I was. And so he really, uh, you know, uh, told me off in no uncertain terms over the telephone a couple of times, which, again, I took it. I thought, well, he's helping Mr. Armstrong. It'll work out, and so on. Well, he's come to sense see that although I had concerns, I was not ever trying to overthrow Stan. I was never trying to do anything like that. I just had genuine concerns about uh, some of the big areas of the work that I felt needed attention, needed straightening out, that there were these misapprehensions, at least, about him and his role, that that was a major concern, which indeed it is. But I would have been one of the last ones that he would have been scheming to put in. I promise you. <laughs> I really do. So you better forget that one. You really even Richard Fleche, who I think leans their way now, but he would, uh, Richard Fleche called them the, the gold dust twins and all this and that because it was always Al and Dave and Dave and Al working these spots together at that time. But anyway, uh, we would come into these meetings 
And uh, they've been there before, the two of them, to have it all set up, how they were going to program us against Mr. Armstrong. And John would come in and he'd have his cup of coffee and sit around and look. And before the meeting began, just right at the wrong time, he'd say, okay, Al, he says, now, what's going to be for today? Are we for him or against him? <laughs> so, anyway, I, uh, a lot of you in the field never knew those things, brethren, but we lived through those things. Those were hairy days. They really were. And, uh, we kind of had to realize what, what was been going on, or had, what had been going on during those days. Anyway, the liberal movement then began in that backdrop of people thinking that uh, Mr. Armstrong was not running the work the way they wanted to. They thought they had better ideas and other ideas, and this also was greatly compounded by the return of Ernest Martin from uh, Brickett Wood, and Ernest had been kind of underground over there, didn't meet regularly with the faculty, wasn't on a faculty athletic team, stayed apart. He began to bring back what was, in fact, just plain Protestant theology, copying whole paragraphs, sometimes whole pages or virtual chapters from the literature put out by this Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and some other little seminary up in Central California. And as I later told some of the liberals talking to them, I said, look, if I wanted to learn all that stuff, you know, my, you've all heard about my Methodist grandmother." You know, if I wanted to learn all that stuff, I could have gone to Southern Methodist University. I didn't need to come out here to learn that stuff, and I mean it. I grew up, and I went to Methodist confirmation classes, and I knew this and that, and that's just the kind of stuff that was coming in to Ambassador College and into our doctrinal meetings that some of these young fellows, well, I, I mean, it blew my mind. I thought that they knew better than that. They regarded this as great new truth. Somehow there's an intellectual vanity that, that makes people want something different. And if it just be a little different and something new and new, if it's just the plain truth of God they've heard before with new embellishments and then going deeper and deeper, they get bored with that. And they've got to keep changing and changing and having something new to titillate their vanity. And that's what they seem to want. But anyway, this began to spread also. And a number of our young men began to go to uh, Claremont Mud. I always say mud. I like that. I get their minds all muddied up. But anyway, they began to go out to Claremont Mud and Fuller Seminary and get these ideas. I would recommend one book very highly to you at this point, by the way. It's called Battle for the Bible. Battle for the Bible. That's not one of our books. It's written by a Protestant. But it shows, even this conservative Protestant is showing what has begun to happen, specifically in Fuller Seminary, the main example he uses, as well as Claremont and some of the others, and how they are shifting away from the truth of God, even that the Protestants once had, and they never did have very much of it, but even they are watering it down in every respect in those seminaries. This is what our young men were getting out there, and they were all filled with vanity and wanting this kind of thing. After Ted came back from his management in 1972, he was a very confused individual. He felt guilty because of all of the involvement and the, the fact that so many of us knew about them by now. He felt that he wondered if he was right, he wondered if his dad was right, he wondered which way was up, frankly. And some of these fellows moved in with him, took him over, began to influence him in this way, and pulled him further and further to the left. And, of course, Robert Kuhn was one of the leading ones of those. And then, finally, you begin to find that, that uh, Wayne Cole was also with Robert. They were the three. Ted and Robert and Wayne were running the work. And the three of them were seen together constantly, going around here and there, working together constantly. Wayne began to be very heavily influenced by that. Dave Adian had been for years and was very leading in that area too, but the three of them began to actually have more leadership. Well, not against anyone, influence toward this liberal, liberal doctrine. And uh, so they began to have this approach. Some of them threatened to resign when Mr. Armstrong came back. They, they told us this, that they either did it directly or through letters or had planned to resign in 1973 when Mr. Armstrong brought back Mr. Hunting to be his uh, executive assistant. They were going to threaten to resign and force him to back down. Now, the kind of men who are always threatening to resign, you know, if they don't get their way, you think about that in relationship to the people of, uh, of, of Korah and his rebellion and all the others. This is, a, this is an attitude that they began to be uh, getting into. Mr. Armstrong, I'm sure, can tell you that Mr. McNair has never threatened to resign. I have never threatened to resign. You give me my way, Mr. Armstrong, or I'm going to resign. Dennis Luker has never threatened to resign. Most of the rest of you, of course, have never done that way to Mr. Armstrong or me or anyone else. I'm not trying to blow our horn, 
But that's not God's way. So then, Robert and Wayne and Dave, in the doctrinal team that got started in 1970, late 73 and 1974, were the leaders. Robert was the coordinator in 1970, late 73 and 1974, were the leaders. Robert was the coordinator with Ted, but Wayne sat right here as the head of the table. And then there were two or three others. I won't name all of them at this point, although Dave Addian was one of them. Some are still with us. I hope they'll be loyal. I hope they'll get this out of their system, though. I really do. Very much. But they began to be the leaders on this doctrinal team. When I came back from Brickett Wood, having been over there about two and a half years, I had known that there were these ideas and attitudes, but I mean this sincerely. And I'm not very easily shocked anymore, but even I was somewhat shocked to realize how far it had gone. I really was. And Mr. McNair, to a certain extent Dr. Hay, I'm not trying to categorize him, but he's, as you know, Dr. Hay, he says something and then retreats and says it in this way and so on to kind of throw them off balance. He told Mr. McNair and me at one time, he said, let's keep still and let them keep on talking and see how far they can go and then they will hang themselves. That was his advice. Then they will just hang themselves. Mr. McNair and I felt maybe we ought to at least confront them with this and that and not let it go too far and hurt the church in the meantime. That's a matter of judgment. But at any rate, they began. When I say they, I mean Robert Kuhn, Wayne Cole, David Annie, and a number of these men who have left the church or had to be put out of the church. They began to suckle it to the public. And I know it was subtle, brethren. A lot of you don't understand it, but very directly to some of us, with sneers and smirks and sarcasm, they began to put down the truth of God about the Sabbath, the holy days, tithing, church government, the fact that Mr. Armstrong is an apostle, and the whole idea of ranks in the ministry, the identity of Israel, which is one of the biggest keys to prophecy that this church has that makes us unique, the fact that the United States and British Commonwealth people are Israel. You can't understand prophecy unless you understand that. Unclean meat, church eras, a place of safety. And I don't mean just Petra. And Mr. Armstrong has never said just Petra. He said Petra's been the most likely place he knew of in the past. But he's never told us Petra is the place. He just said it's the most likely place. And we still. But all these things begin to be put down in a subtle way before the church. They begin to be made fun of and ridicule was used on them, or belittling comments so the right in Ambassador College. And I personally can bring before you, if we had to, uh, you know, 15, 25, whatever you want, number of students who were in the classes, including, frankly, some of our graduate sabbatical students, like Mr. Luker, who came back, like Mr. Jimmy Wells, who came back, and like a number of others out there of you who came back and were shocked at what was being taught. In uh, Dave Addian's class and marriage and the family, about the fact that the husband really isn't the head of the wife, and we can't be sure of that, and we can't be sure of something else. About some of them we're teaching, and I won't name the other names of the men doing this, but you and our Fry Burke, Keith Crouch, and others were teaching virtually as fact the documentary hypothesis, which means, of course, when you read it, study it, that the Old Testament was not inspired of God at all, but that it was simply sort of put together by these scribes, E and H and J. And these unknown scribes kind of got these old Jewish traditions and allegories and put them together, and then later these scholars put them together in a different way, and somehow it all evolved as, what, as to what we have in the Old Testament. became what we have in the Old Testament of God, and it was taught to students rather thoroughly, and then it was told them, it was never said this was not the truth, then they said, well, of course, you have to make up your mind. And some of the students literally went to those men, and they said, well, why can't you teach us the truth, though? And knock in the head these. Oh, well, you have to make up your mind. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. They didn't say, this is the truth, and I believe in the documentary hypothesis. No, it was done more subtly than that. It was just taught. Well, this is one of the main understandings about how we came to have the Old Testament. And then they proceeded to teach that, maybe for days at a time. And then in about five seconds or five minutes, they'd say, well, there are other ideas, but you have to make up your mind. And the truth of how to knock down the documentary hypothesis, the truth about what we believe and why, that wasn't taught very much. These other ideas were taught to our unsuspecting young kids in Ambassador College, and even to a great number of you who came in for sabbatical, these attitudes and these ideas and these approaches, without very much on the other side, depending on the teacher. Each teacher was infected to a lesser or greater extent in this particular liberal movement. They didn't all believe exactly the same thing among themselves, by the way. I want to point that out. Some of them might say, oh, I didn't believe this, and I didn't believe that. 
and they might be true. Some of them right. believed we were Israel, but didn't believe in tithing. Others didn't believe tithing, and, and they didn't believe in Israel, and so on. Wayne Cole told me personally, sitting in the Shape Hall restaurant in Pasadena, just he and I together, because this had come up in the meeting about tithing. And I said, well, Wayne, how come you feel tithing is not a law? Because we've always thought that, you've thought that, and we know how it was always a law in the Bible, and how Christ then said, you know, uh, the tithing uh, is a law. And I, if I get the quote started, I can finish, but I better look at it here just to get it started. Matthew 23, 23, and Luke 11, 42. But he said, Woe unto you, scribes, uh, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint, anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done, that is, judgment, mercy, and faith, and not to leave the other, that is, tithing, undone. That's Christ's command. Don't leave tithing undone. And that is Christ's command. And that's what he said. But, of course, they don't go along with that. They try to water that down or don't put that sometimes in their papers, pretend that that doesn't exist. And back in Hebrews 7, where Paul is talking about the tithing law. I don't have time to explain it thoroughly. I will. But the particular law he's talking about here is the law of tithing. And he said, for the priesthood being changed, verse 12, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. This is Hebrews 7:12, And the Greek word there. Metaphysis means a transfer of the law. You see, in other words, the law of tithing is a transfer to Christ's priesthood or the Christ ministry rather than the Levitical priesthood. And uh, they, they, they completely uh, mis, you know, use that scripture or leave it out. And the others in the New Testament would show that God never changed that. There's nothing where God ever changed it. But anyway, finally Wayne kind of uh, said this. He said, well, maybe tithing is a law, but he said you can't prove it in the Bible. Well, I said, well, if you can't prove it in the Bible, I'm just giving you this example, not to knock him, but so you can understand, fellas and brethren, how it was handled in a subtle manner. He said, maybe it's a law in the mind of God. Oh, it's a law in the mind of God, but you can't prove it in the Bible. And I said, well, maybe, uh, how are we sure we can do it? Well, maybe it's a church law. I, oh, I see, it's a law maybe in the mind of God. He said, maybe, and then maybe we have the authority of the church to say you're to do it. Well, I didn't tell Wayne that then, but I could see which way we were going in those meetings. Sure. And I thought, uh-oh, but if Wayne and Robert and, and Dave and these others get control yes. of the church, then are we going to have a law? Not on your life. You see how quick that could change if it's put on that basis. And uh, the problem sure. was the cynical attitude began to spread. Yes. And Mr. McNair and I and others were put down and ridiculed. I mean, they literally sat there and laughed with sarcasm sure. if we would try to uphold the doctrine of Israel of us being Israel or any of others of those of those things yes, that church that believes. Of everything that God has yes. in the church. Yes, sir. Yes. All the key things. Uh, one of those yes. men told, I think at least two other individuals yes. who are probably here still with us, yes. that the whole key was Acts 15. Yes. And our man asked, well, what... what? Good. He yes. said, well, what... what uh, what do you mean, Acts 15? He said, well, what Paul, did Paul teach the Gentiles to believe? In other words, uh, what, what did they have to do with the Old Testament? The, you know, no fornication, no meat off to idols, no blood, and no things strangled. That's it. He said, you mean, he said, that's it. That's all you have to do. And the idea was, you don't have to keep the Sabbath. You don't have to keep the Holy Days. You don't have to keep the Ten Commandments. That's it. You see the picture? One of those two men said that. And uh, this was, it began to be an approach. And they, they'd kind of bring it out here and then bring it out. And then if Mr. Armstrong or one of us who was in the work with him, and they knew might have contact with him some, they met them head on, then it was kind of like a little weasel, you know. He's running around, and then he goes back down in his hole. Then he peeps out, yeah. then he comes out and tells the moral eyes, then he jumps back down in his hole again. And they were afraid of us, very afraid. No wonder they didn't want us to see Mr. Armstrong. No wonder they were afraid that we would have contact with him. Because we knew what they were doing and that this was their Achilles heel, this thing of doctrine. They were going further and further and further to the left. Finally, in 1976 or 7, I've forgotten the year on this, doesn't really make any difference, but Wayne Cole left that area. He had to be sent to Canada for personal and spiritual reasons, as a lot of you know. And then... After he came back, and even before he came back, brought back by Ted Armstrong, 
wild gossip began to be starting all through the ministry. That began early this year, this past year, 1978. We had always had gossip, and now it began to be wild gossip. I mean, horrible things yes. were beginning to be uh, spewed out, coming from Pasadena. Mr. Armstrong had to come down from Oregon because of the uh, middle. Mr. Armstrong has two or three babies scattered all around over here. Mr. Rader uh, has mistresses all over. Mr. Rader and Cornwall are homosexuals. Uh, Henry Cornwall ran off, not with 5,200, not with 52,000, but the rumor said 52 million. That, that's pretty clever. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, that, that, he's really sharp. He runs off with a whole year's income, and no one misses it. <laughs> 52 million. That was the figure going around. I heard that rumor myself more than once. He was really clever. All of you got your paychecks that year, and all the other bills were paid that year, but somehow he ran off with a whole year's income, almost a whole year's income from the United States. That was really smart. I mean, they were just wild, crazy things. I, I mean that, brethren. But here's the problem. When people would ask these people who heard these rumors, and we'd try to trace them back, Mr. Helge and his whole staff did, and others, and they'd, they'd say, well, that's from a very high source. Or that from a very high uh, leader in the work on the fourth floor or in the hall of administration. Or they'd say, that's, quote, confidential information, end quote. We kept getting this same phrase, oh, that's from someone very high. And then we begin to trace it back and trace it back, and we find that it was from some of those very men. That they were spreading this out all over the United States and all over this earth and saying, if you would ask you tell them that that's confidential information, or that's from a very high source, and I can't tell you, and that's from a man that's on the fourth floor, or whatever, and uh, they're just crazy things that have no basis whatsoever. Rob, you only mentioned the tip of the iceberg. I know. I didn't want to say all the. I didn't want to say all the vile things that they were bringing up, but uh, uh, that just gives you an idea. That was just some of the type of rumors that were being spread, and uh, so these. Uh, we traced it back to that, that same group, brethren. We really have. And we've got witnesses, and, uh, and well, some of you here are, are witnesses to that fact. Yeah. Then one of our area coordinators came out last May when this thing began to be going on what? and was talking to Mr. Cole, what? and uh, he was upset at Mr. Armstrong what? even last May, and he said, uh, he says, I question if God's Spirit is working in either of the Armstrongs. This was Wayne Cole's statement about Mr. Herbert Armstrong last spring. I question if God's Spirit is working in either of the Armstrongs. And we find from, he's told several of us, that he has his resignation any time, or that is Wayne Cole. Uh, he's carried, in fact, for a while, I think he carries it around and had his resignation ready at any time and was threatening Mr. Armstrong to resign more than once if he didn't get his way as a matter of pressure and questioning whether God was working with him. And uh, that's the problem with this kind of approach and this kind of demanding attitude. Uh, also, one of our other men uh, heard last May that he had said, I would like to walk away from this work and never hear the name Armstrong again. Again, he could be further from the truth. We are not going to do that at all. Mr. Armstrong, again, will re well remember, and everyone at Pasadena who was in on it will remember, liberal and conservative, because Robert Kuhn told me this himself, the number one man who came to Mr. Armstrong, finally someone coming with a whole truth about it and in a humble and a patient attitude about it instead of a smart, aleck, feisty, rebellious attitude. Mr. Raymond McNair came to Mr. Armstrong in the right attitude about Pentecost and he had truths that Ernest Martin did not have and never did have and they still not have for all. Mr. Armstrong convey those facts to him and get Pentecost changed. And do you think that Raymond McNair got it changed and now he's going to jump right back again? Well, if you know that man, he's one of the most steady men in the whole work of God. He doesn't change around like that. So he and I accepted that immediately. We're very glad to have that change. And on DNR, Mr. Manair changed on that reasonably fast, but not too fast. He had some questions. I had some questions for a few months, frankly, and we conveyed them to Mr. Armstrong. The first paper that came out was not technically accurate at all, and because of those inaccuracies, and the fact that we had been taught for many years, and I had taught, and all of us had taught, what God has bound together, let not man put asunder. You know, it just rang in my mind. I thought, I'm not going to compromise. And I will not compromise with God's law either, because Mr. Armstrong has taught me that. And God has taught me that. But then I find, found, finally, I did not have to compromise. And we do understand that the correct manner now. And I'm very grateful for that. And very grateful 
to God, not to have to go back to telling these young couples, well, you've got to split up. So we have no desire to change back on that, or make up either, for that matter. Yes. Just a little input there. I'd like to just put a little in there uh, about uh, the uh, uh, day of Pentecost. Uh, I never did accept uh, the arguments of, uh, again, I can't remember names, uh, Ernest Martin. And, and I don't know, but uh, it was this, it was Raymond McNair who brought to me the fact that every place, the Hebrew word that is translated in Leviticus 23 uh, as uh, you know, all in one verse twice uh, from the morrow after the Sabbath, uh, that the uh, word that is translated into the English word from Everywhere else that that, that uh, Hebrew word was used, anywhere else in the Bible, it was always translated into the, into the English word on. And still that wasn't enough to convince me. Because 52 years ago, I had researched in every translation uh, of the Bible that existed at that time. And everyone said count from a Sunday. 52 days from a Sunday. Now, if I'm going to count 52 from Sunday, one day from Sunday is not still Sunday, it is Monday. And it still is, and I still stand on that. But when he said everywhere it, it, it is on instead of from, then I began to wonder. Now, I called a Jewish woman in Israel, long distance clear over into Israel, at a kibbutz, who is teaching Hebrew, uh, and, uh, that is the Bible in Hebrew. And I had her, I just said, look, I want you to get your Hebrew Bible and tell me uh, 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 how to count. What day does it come out, uh, counting the 50 days? She said, well, it comes out on Sunday. I said, are you sure? Which day do you count first? And she said, well, uh, the first day to count is a Sunday. And so it comes out on Sunday. Well, I still wasn't convinced. And then... I had uh, uh, Dr. Uh, oh, Any time I want to say a man's name, it won't come to me. Uh, huh? Dr. Dorothy. Uh, we, we looked up to see if there were uh, some uh, scholars of the uh, RSV, the Revised Standard Translation. And uh, we found one of them. They got him on the cell phone, and I talked to him. And uh, he says, no, you count Sunday as number one. I said, you can't do that. I said, one day from Sunday is not Sunday. And finally, he agreed. He said, well, Mr. Armstrong, he says, Hebrew people, when they come to English, they will use the word from. And, but he says, I can see that you don't. this doesn't really mean that in English. He said, no, I am the chairman of a committee to revise that revised standard. And that's coming out now in about another year or two. And uh, really, it, it may be even more accurate than the uh, King James Version. I use the King James mostly because that's what everybody's familiar with, and they all have it, and they understand it better. But in some ways, I think the revised standard is even more accurate. And... Uh, then we called another man. From him, we got the name of another man who was on that committee and uh, had a long hassle with him on the telephone, and finally he agreed. But the first man said, I am chairman of the committee to revise the revised standard. And he said, Mr. Armstrong, I will see that it is stated uh, uh, commencing on or beginning on or beginning with a Sunday. You count 50 days. Now, if it had been that way, I, I, 52 years ago, I would have had it correct. And it was just exactly 40 years that God let it go that way. Now, I'm going to show you something about that this afternoon, when uh, uh, I am sure that God found that on earth and in heaven for 40 years, and that we, in God's sight, were keeping the right date for 40 years. But God could have brought that to me 52 years ago. And I would have said it on Sunday. And as soon as I had proof, as soon as I had evidence, my mind was open, I did change it. And I will not change without proof. But I will always change whenever it is proved 
that I have been wrong. And I have proved that now. It's the same way. I don't need to go into that now. But it is the same way on the matter of DNR. It came about something we had never seen, had never considered. Ernest Martin didn't supply any of the, of the arguments uh, that were acceptable in any way at all. And, uh, uh, however, there was something that we found that none of us had understood or seen before. And so uh, we have, but I want to say that that doctrine is being overrun and taken advantage of today uh, very greatly. And we're just going clear overboard. You get an inch and we want to take a mile. And uh, the people are being divorced and remarried in a way that they shouldn't. And we're going to tighten up on that in the church. But we want to be wherever Christ is. The living Christ is the head of this church, as Dr. Meredith has just said. And he does direct me. But my mind is always open. I'm going to have something to say about these things this afternoon. Thank you. Why, another part of the uh, picture that I think is misunderstood is that uh, some have said, and again it's widely rumored among many of you, that uh, Stan Rader schemed uh, to get rid of Wayne and get me put in. Now, Stan and I both have had a good laugh about that because, uh, frankly, uh, Stan, up until very recently, uh, liked Wayne and had more confidence in Wayne than he did me. He had heard the complete, yeah, he'd heard the complete uh, black, you know, blackening job, as others have told me, that had been done on me for years by Ted. And even uh, Steve Martin was very close to Wayne and uh, maybe here this afternoon. But Steve Martin has told me, that many others, even of their group, have told me that no one was black and more and during those years than I was by a constant barrage of negativisms about my approach, my personality, everything that could possibly be brought up was brought up year after year after year. And, of course, many did begin to believe that because if you say something often enough, as, as Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, began to say, if you, you, you uh, say something big enough and loud enough and often enough, the bigger and the louder the lie, then the more likely people are to believe it. And uh, so, but anyway, Stan and I even had a little uh, set to a few months ago, which Mr. Armstrong knows about, and maybe you didn't realize I'm not bringing something out hidden here, Mr. Armstrong. Stan actually commented on this himself before the brethren in Pasadena just recently with many of you ministers sitting there. But uh, he had been sort of programmed against me, and he'd heard that I was suspicious of him, which I was. <laughs> See? And I'll come to that later. Which I was. And so he really, uh, you know, uh, told me off. In no uncertain terms, over the telephone a couple of times, which, again, I took it. I thought, well, he's helping Mr. Armstrong. It'll work out, and so on. Well, he's come to see that although I had concerns, I was not ever trying to overthrow Stan. I was never trying to do anything like that. I just had genuine concerns about uh, some of the big areas of the work that I felt needed attention, needed straightening out, that there were these misapprehensions, at least, about him and his role, that that was a major concern, which indeed it is. But I would have been one of the last ones that he would have been scheming to put in. I promise you. <laughs> I really do. So you better forget that one. You really even Richard Fouché, who I think leans their way now, but he would, uh, Richard Fouché called them the, the gold dust twins and all this and that because it was always Al and Dave and Dave and Al working these spots together at that time. But anyway, uh, we would come into these meetings and uh, they'd been there before, the two of them, to have it all set up, how they were going to program us against Mr. Armstrong. And John would come in and he'd have his cup of coffee and sit around and look and before the meeting began, just right at the wrong time. He'd say, okay, Al, he says, now, what's going to be for today? Are we for him or against him? <laughs> so, anyway, I, uh, a lot of you in the field never knew those things, brethren, but we lived through those things. Those were hairy days. They really were. And, uh, we kind of had to realize what, what was been going on, or had, what had been going on during those days. Anyway, the liberal movement then began in that backdrop of people thinking that uh, Mr. Armstrong was not running the work the way they wanted to. They thought they had better ideas and other ideas. And this also was greatly compounded by the return of Ernest Martin from uh, Brick and Wood. And Ernest had been kind of underground over there, didn't meet regularly with the faculty, wasn't on a faculty athletic team, stayed apart. He began to bring back what was, in fact, just plain Protestant theology, copying whole paragraphs, sometimes whole pages or virtual chapters from the 
literature put out by this Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and some other little seminary up in Central California. And as I later told some of the liberals talking to them, I said, look, if I wanted to learn all that stuff, you know, my, you've all heard about my Methodist grandmother, you know, if I wanted to learn all that stuff, I could have gone to Southern Methodist University. I didn't need to come out here to learn that stuff, and I mean it. I grew up and I went to Methodist confirmation classes, and I knew this and that, and that's just the kind of stuff that was coming in to Ambassador College and into our doctrinal meetings that some of these young fellows, well, I, I mean, it blew my mind. I thought that they knew better than that. They regarded this as great new truth. Somehow there's an intellectual vanity that, that makes people want something different. And if it gets to be a little different and something new and new, if it's just the plain truth of God they've heard before with new embellishments and then going deeper and deeper, they get bored with that. And they've got to keep changing and changing and having something new to titillate their vanity. And that's what they seem to want. But anyway, this began to spread also. And a number of our young men began to go to uh, Claremont Mud. I always say mud. I like that. I get their minds all muddied up. But anyway, they began to go out to Claremont Mud and Fuller Seminary and get these ideas. I would recommend one book very highly to you at this point, by the way. It's called Battle for the Bible. Battle for the Bible. That's not one of our books. It's written by a Protestant. But it shows, even this conservative Protestant is showing what has begun to happen, specifically in Fuller Seminary, the main example he uses, as well as Claremont and some of the others, and how they are shifting away from the truth of God, even that the Protestants once had, and they never did have very much of it, but even they are watering it down in every respect in those seminaries. This is what our young men were getting out there, and they were all filled with vanity and wanting this kind of thing. After Ted came back from his management in 1972, he was a very confused individual. He felt guilty because of all of the involvement and the, the fact that so many of us knew about them by now. He felt that he wondered if he was right, he wondered if his dad was right, he wondered which way was up, frankly. And some of these fellows moved in with him, took him over, began to influence him in this way, and pulled him further and further to the left. And, of course, Robert Kuhn was one of the leading ones of those. And then, finally, you begin to find that, that uh, Wayne Cole was also with Robert. They were the three. Ted and Robert and Wayne were running the work. And the three of them were seen together constantly, going around here and there, working together constantly, Wayne began to be very heavily influenced by that. Dave Adian had been for years and was very leading in that area too, but the three of them began to actually have more leadership. Mm. Not against anyone, influenced towards this liberal, liberal doctrine. And uh, so they began to have this approach. Some of them threatened to resign when Mr. Armstrong came back. They, they told us this, that they either did it directly or through letters or had planned to resign in 1973 when Mr. Armstrong brought back Mr. Hunting to be his uh, executive assistant. They were going to threaten to resign and force him to back down. Now, the kind of men who are always threatening to resign, you know, if they don't get their way, you think about that in relationship to the people of, uh, of, of Korah and his rebellion and all the others. This is, a, this is an attitude that began to be uh, getting into Mr. Armstrong, I'm sure, can tell you that Mr. McNair has never threatened to resign. I have never threatened to resign. You give me my way, Mr. Armstrong, or I'm going to resign. Dennis Luker has never threatened to resign. Most of the rest of you, of course, have never done that way to Mr. Armstrong or me or anyone else. I'm not trying to blow our horn, but that's not God's way. So then Robert and Wayne and Dave in the doctrinal team that got started in 1970, late 73 and 1974, were the leaders. Robert was the coordinator in 1970, late 73 and 1974, were the leaders. Robert was the coordinator with Ted, but Wayne sat right here as the head of the table. And then there were two or three others. I won't name all of them at this point, although Dave Adian was one of them. Some are still with us. I hope they'll be loyal. I hope they'll get this out of their system, though. I really do. Very much. They began to be the leaders on this doctrinal team. When I came back from Brickett Wood, having been over there about two and a half years. I had known that there were these ideas and attitudes, but I mean this sincerely, and I'm not very easily shocked anymore, but even I was somewhat shocked to realize how far it had gone. I really was. And Mr. McNair, to a certain extent Dr. Hay, I'm not trying to categorize him, but he, as you know, Dr. Hay, he says something and then retreats and says it in this way and so on to kind of throw them off balance. He told Mr. McNair and me at one time, he said, let's keep still 
and let them keep on talking and see how far they can go, and then they will hang themselves. That was his advice. Then they will just hang themselves. Mr. McNair and I felt maybe we ought to at least confront them with this and that and not let it go too far and hurt the church in the meantime. That's a matter of judgment. But at any rate, they began. When I say they, I mean Robert Kuhn, Wayne Cole, David Annie, and a number of these men who have left the church or had to be put out of the church. They began to subtly to the public. And I know it was subtle, brethren. A lot of you don't understand it, but very directly to some of us, with sneers and smirks and sarcasm, they began to put down the truth of God about the Sabbath, the holy days, tithing, church government, the fact that Mr. Armstrong is an apostle, and the whole idea of ranks in the ministry, the identity of Israel, which is one of the biggest keys to prophecy that this church has that makes us unique, the fact that the United States and British Commonwealth people are Israel. You can't understand prophecy unless you understand that. Unclean meat, church eras, a place of safety. And I don't mean just Petra. And Mr. Armstrong has never said just Petra. He said Petra's been the most likely place he knew of in the past, but he's never told us Petra is the place. He just said it's the most likely place, and we still. But all these things begin to be put down in a subtle way before the church. They begin to be made fun of, and ridicule was used on them, or belittling comments. So the right in Ambassador College, and I personally can bring before you, if we had to, uh, you know, 15, 25, whatever you want, number of students who were in the classes, including, frankly, some of our graduate sabbatical students, no. like Mr. Luker, who came back, like Mr. Yeah. Jimmy Wells, who came back, and like a number of others out there of you who came back and were shocked at what was being taught oh. in uh, Dave Addian's class and marriage and the family about the fact that the husband really isn't the head of the wife, and we can't be sure of that, and we can't be sure of something else about some of them we're teaching, and I won't name the other names of them men doing this, but you and our Fry, Burke, Keith Crouch, and others were teaching virtually as fact the documentary hypothesis, which means, of course, when you read it, study it, that the Old Testament was not inspired of God at all, but that it was simply sort of put together by these scribes, E and H and J, and these unknown scribes kind of got these old Jewish traditions and allegories and put them together, and then later these scholars put them together in a different way, and somehow it all evolved as, what, as to what we have in the Old Testament, became what we have in the Old Testament of God, and it was taught to students rather thoroughly, and then... And it was told them, it was never said this was not the truth. Then they said, well, of course, you have to make up your mind. And some of the students literally went to those men, and they said, well, why can't you teach us the truth, though, and knock them the head these? Oh, well, you have to make up your mind. You see what I mean? They didn't say, this is the truth, and I believe in the documentary hypothesis. No, it was done more subtly than that. It was just taught. Well, this is one of the main understandings about how we came to have the Old Testament. And then they proceeded to teach that maybe for days at a time, and then in about five seconds or five minutes, they'd say, well, there are other ideas, but you have to make up your mind. And the truth of how to knock down the documentary hypothesis, the truth about what we believe and why, that wasn't taught very much. These other ideas were taught to our unsuspecting young kids in Ambassador College, and even to a great number of you who came in for sabbatical, these attitudes and these ideas and these approaches, without very much on the other side, depending on the teacher. Each teacher was infected to a lesser or greater extent in this particular liberal movement. They didn't all believe exactly the same thing among themselves, by the way. I want to point that out. Because some of them might say, oh, I didn't believe this, and I didn't believe that, and they might be true. Some of them believed we were Israel, but didn't believe in tithing. Others didn't believe tithing, and, and they didn't believe in Israel, and so on. Wayne Cole told me personally, sitting in the Shape Hall restaurant in Pasadena, just he and I together, because this had come up in the meeting about tithing, and I said, well, Wayne, how come you feel tithing is not a law? Because we've always thought that, you've thought that, and we know how it was always a law in the Bible, and how Christ then said, you know, uh, the tithing uh, is a law. And I, if I get the quote started, I can finish, but I better look at it here just to get it started. Matthew 23, 23, and Luke 11, 42. But he said, woe unto you, scribes, uh, Pharisees, and hypocrites, for you pay tithes of mint, anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. Judgment, mercy, and faith, these ought you to have done, that is, judgment, mercy, and faith, and not to leave the other, that is, tithing, undone. That's Christ's command. Don't leave tithing undone. And that is Christ's command. That's what he said. 
But, of course, they don't go along with that. They try to water that down or don't put that sometimes in their papers, pretend that that doesn't exist. And back in Hebrews 7, where Paul is talking about the tithing law, I don't have time to explain it thoroughly, I will, but the particular law he's talking about here is the law of tithing. And he said, for the priesthood being changed, verse 12, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. This is Hebrews 7, 12, and the Greek word there, metaphysis, means a transfer of the law. You see, in other words, the law of tithing is a transfer to Christ's priesthood or the Christ ministry rather than the Levitical priesthood. And uh, they, they, they completely uh, mis, you know, use that scripture or leave it out. And the others in the New Testament would show that God never changed that. There's nothing where God ever changed it. But anyway, finally Wayne kind of uh, said this. He said, well, maybe tithing is a law, but he said you can't prove it in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Well, I said, well, if you can't prove it in the Bible, I'm just giving you this example, not to knock him, but so you can understand, fellas and brethren, how it was handled in a subtle manner. He said, maybe it's a law in the mind of God. Oh, it's a law in the mind of God that you can't prove it from the Bible. Sure. And I said, well, maybe, uh, how are we sure we can do it? Well, maybe it's a church law. One. I, oh, I see, it's a law maybe in the mind of God. He said, maybe, and then maybe we have the authority of the church to say you're to do it. Well, I didn't tell Wayne that then, but I could see which way we were going in those meetings. Sure. And I thought, uh-oh, but if Wayne and Robert and, and Dave and these others get control yes. of the church, then are we going to have a law? Not on your life. You see how quick that could change if it's put on that basis. And uh, the problem was the cynical attitude began to spread. Yes. And Mr. McNair and I and others were put down and ridiculed. I mean, they literally sat there and laughed with sarcasm if we would try to uphold the doctrine of Israel, of us being Israel, or any of others of those, of those things that church believes. Yes, sir. All the key things. Uh, one of those men told... I think at least two other individuals who are probably here still with us, that the whole key was Acts 15. And our man asked, well, what, what, good. He said, well, what, what, uh, what do you mean, Acts 15? He said, well, what Paul, did Paul teach the Gentiles to believe? In other words, uh, what, what did they have to do with the Old Testament? That, you know, no fornication, no meat off to idols, no blood, and no things strangled. That's it. He said, you mean, he said, that's it, that's all you have to do. And the idea was, you don't have to keep the Sabbath, you don't have to keep the Holy Days, you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments, that's it. You see the picture? One of those two men said that. And uh, this was, it began to be an approach. And they they try to bring it out here and then bring it out. And then if Mr. Armstrong or one of us who was in the work with him, and they knew might have contact with him some they met them head on, then it was kind of like a little weasel, you know. He's running around, and then he goes back down in his hole. Then he peeps out, yeah. then he comes out and tells the moral lies, then he jumps back down in his hole again. And they were afraid of us, very afraid. No wonder they didn't want us to see Mr. Armstrong. No wonder they were afraid that we would have contact with him. Because we knew what they were doing, and that this was their Achilles heel, this thing of doctrine. They were going further and further and further to the left. Finally... In 1976 or 7, I've forgotten the year on this, doesn't really make any difference, but Wayne Cole left that area. He had to be sent to Canada for personal and spiritual reasons, as a lot of you know. And then after he came back, and even before he came back, brought back by Ted Armstrong, wild gossip began to be starting all through the ministry. That began early this year, this past year, 1978. We'd always had gossip, but now it began to be wild gossip. I mean, horrible things were beginning to be uh, spewed out, coming from Pasadena. Mr. Armstrong had to come down from Oregon because of uh, a middle. Mr. Armstrong has two or three babies scattered all around over here. Mr. Rader uh, has mistresses all over. Mr. Rader and Cornwall are homosexual. Uh, Henry Cornwall ran off. Not with 5,200, not with 52,000, but the rumor said 52 million. That, that's pretty clever. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I, that, that, he's really sharp. He runs off with a whole year's income, and no one misses it. <laughs> 52 million. That was the figure going around. I heard that rumor myself more than once. He was really clever. All of you got your paychecks that year, and all the other bills were paid that year. 
But somehow he ran off with a whole year's income, almost a whole year's income from the United States. That was really smart. I mean, they were just wild, crazy things. I, I mean that, brethren. But here's the problem. When people would ask these people who heard these rumors, and we'd try to trace them back, Mr. Helge and his whole staff did, and others, and they'd, they'd say, well, that's from a very high source, or that's from a very high uh, leader in the work on the fourth floor, or in the hall of administration. Or they'd say, that's, quote, confidential information, end quote. We kept getting this same phrase, oh, that's from someone very high. And then we begin to trace it back, and trace it back, and we find that it was from some of those very men. So that they were spreading this out all over the United States and all over this earth. And saying, if anyone would ask you, tell them that that's confidential information, or that's from a very high source, and I can't tell you. And that's from a man that's on the fourth floor. Or whatever, and uh, they're just crazy things that have no basis whatsoever. Rob, you only mentioned the tip of the iceberg. I know. I didn't want to say all the. I didn't want to say all the vile things that they were bringing up, but uh, uh, that just gives you an idea. That was just some of the type of rumors that were being spread, and uh, so these uh, we traced it back to that that same group, brethren. We really have, and we've got witnesses, and uh, and from some of you here are our witnesses to that fact. Yeah. Then one of our area coordinators came out last May when this thing began to be going on what? and was talking to Mr. Cole what? and uh, he was upset at Mr. Armstrong even last May and he said, uh, he says, I question if God's Spirit is working in either of the Armstrong. This was Wayne Cole's statement about Mr. Herbert Armstrong last spring. I question what? if God's Spirit is working in either of the Armstrong. And we find from He's told several of us that he has his resignation any time, or that is Wayne Cole. Uh, he's carried, in fact, for a while, I think he carried it around and had his resignation ready at any time and was threatening Mr. Armstrong to resign more than once if he didn't get his way as a matter of pressure and questioning whether God was working with him. And uh, that's the problem with this kind of approach and this kind of demanding attitude. Uh, also, one of our other men uh, heard last May that he had said, I would like to walk away from this work and never hear the name Armstrong again. Again, this was last spring. So we don't like, and I don't want to indulge in character assassination myself, and I hope I'm not, but I know there's been such a wave of feeling among many of you saying, well, Mr. Armstrong made a great mistake, and this is all a great misunderstanding. Well, brethren, this is not a great misunderstanding. This is something that has been going on for five or seven years in the minds and hearts of certain individuals, to change the doctrine of this church further and further to the left, and to finally unseat Mr. Armstrong, and it was not all a coherent plot or conspiracy all the time, but the attitudes began to seize, and they began to emerge in this movement and that movement. And as you know, uh, Dave Andian joined Al Pertoon in, in rebelling against the work openly in 74. So this is the second time around for Dave. And then we let him come back, and uh, then Wayne was threatening to resign and so forth a number of times. And uh, then, finally, uh, a few weeks ago, about a week before, Mr. Armstrong may know the details on this, but about a week before this spot, or this, this thing ever broke, this receivership and all, Wayne went over to Tucson to get Mr. Herbert Armstrong to put Dave Annian in as the business manager for the whole work of God worldwide. Now, does that make a light come on in the back of your mind? Here are these two men working together, working together, liberals, the liberal doctrine for years, and now he brings Dave Addian over there. Wayne told us, tries to pressure Mr. Armstrong into putting him over the business. Well, Dave has no, no training in business, whatever. He's never been in business in his life. But he was supposed to be over the money for the work of God worldwide. You see, and then if Wayne got in another office, they would have it, to, they would have it all sold up. I might say they thought I was so senile that they could just push me over like that. But they didn't. Well, then... Uh, rumors and stories began to circulate and direct statements from some of those men and their lieutenants. And their lieutenants. Some of whom, are, or assume, uh, some of whom excuse me, are still here trying to think and talk about this complicated spot. But, and I hope they will repent. And I hope all of you will as you see this picture if you've been involved in this. I hope I repent of any wrong attitudes I get in. We've all got to if we're going to be in God's kingdom. But they began to tell a number of, of you, a number of us, that the work of God is going to get it, right. and there's going to be a big house cleaning, and the government's coming in, 
And they were already, we find now, cooperating with the dissidents, working with them, helping feed them information, including Ben Chapman getting stuff right out of data processing, feeding it to these dissidents, who are not our members now, but have become Ted's members. Earl Timmons and that whole gang have been Ted's members for a long time, brethren. They're not our members. And they were programmed by Ted, and then by some of these fellows in the later stages, perhaps, to begin to directly work against us. And so this began to be rumored, that the work of God is going to have a big investigation, and we're going to be overthrown, and we're going to get it. Then immediately after the investigation began, and the raid, as it was, on ambassadors, we called the Tsar News from these auditors, not coming out and asking, can we check your books, which we would have let, let them do immediately, been glad to, always did, and the IRS had all kinds of investigations on us. Something right here, that uh, the IRS, that is the Internal Revenue, of the United States government, uh, just uh, fairly recently, has finished an 18-month in-depth investigation on, into our books and our finances. They went down into every little detail, and they gave us an absolutely clean bill of health. And our books have been kept in a better fashion and more accurately than almost any corporation. And that is the truth. I've heard that from a number of our men. We've got sharp men there and dedicated men and that have worked long and hard, like Jack Bickett, George Birdwell, longtime church members in there, and they have a very fine set of books, and the books themselves, the ledger, and then the computer, and kind of a double or tri- triple checking system, which really obviates even the very much possibility of anyone running off with any sizable amount of money. It just couldn't be done. It would show up in too many different directions, and that's the way they set it up that way. And... Uh, uh, maybe more about that later, but I think that's important for you to understand. But anyway, immediately after this thing began in this raid, instead of Wayne staying with the flock and trying to help out and encourage the ministers and the brethren, he went back here to Tucson, came back here, to say that's where we are, and he, with others, to pressure Mr. Armstrong to make him chief of staff, and late at night got uh, uh, the permission to make himself chief executive officer, I should say, but Mr. Armstrong did not put that as a legal thing, but as a news release. And they got Dr. Hay in on to it to use his credibility, because they knew that if they could get one older evangelist, they knew that Raymond and I and D-Bar were out, obviously we wouldn't go with them at all, but they tried to get Dr. Hay to use his credibility with Mr. Armstrong. And so they brought Dr. Hay out to Wayne's house. And who did he find sitting there in Wayne's house that afternoon, before they came to Mr. Armstrong's house that Thursday night, just before all of us, a lot of us here, right. went into that employees meeting the next day. Uh, they, he found sitting there in Wayne Cole's living room, Robert Kuhn. Well, that concerned him right away because he knew he'd heard, and of course Raymond and I had heard, that Mr. Armstrong had commanded Wayne Cole two or three times at least to put Robert Kuhn out of the church. And instead of putting him out of the church, Wayne had him there in his living room helping plan and plot this whole thing. And so they were there. And then all of a sudden, he began to hear a call from the Timmons, and they were trying to get to Wayne, and he was talking with them and with the opposition, and it was suggested that Robert, I mean that uh, uh, Dr. Hay and Art McCarroll would go have lunch, while Wayne and the others talked to Robert Timmons, and that he began to realize, and told me later, and some of these dissident members and lawyers for the plaintiffs, the ones who were fighting us, and that Wayne and Dave, we found through what he said and others sent, were cooperating actively before and during the suit with the opposition. They were actually working with the opposition to overthrow the work of God. Some of you thought it's some little thing. It is not a little thing. You better add something right here. Uh, uh, well, it was right at the time that I did fellowship between Cole and uh, David Andean. It was a telephone conversation, and it was a red hot one. Ray, uh, Wayne Cole and David Andy and together on the other end in Pasadena and myself wow. here in uh, Tucson. And they were urging me to not let our attorneys defend us in any way. And they said that we should let the uh, uh, court-appointed uh, receiver, who was an ex-judge, uh, appoint our defense for us. Now, he was working hand in hand, and I already knew that. He was allowed at $100 an hour to have uh, an assistant, and his assistant is the attorney for the accusa- accusers that brought the suit, the one who's trying to have us put out. 
And they were arguing with me in heated words to let our very accuser be our defense or appoint our defense attorney. God showed me that night, if never before, that Wayne Cole was an enemy of this work, and I put him out. Now, if you want to know why he's disfellowship, that's it. If I am God's apostle, God shows me things. Sorry. And I don't have to account any further than that. But God had it done. And it was, as I say, it was done in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of the living God. And there is, there is now a, a house cleaning, and I'm not sure it's completed yet. Well, then, after they got over there, you heard what took place there. They got this uh, press, press release. They came back, and uh, Wayne Cole then came in this meeting the next day with the receiver. I may be having my exact date wrong there. I guess this was probably Wednesday night and then Thursday morning was the meeting with the receiver. I'm not writing all this down in exact order, but that was it. And the receiver is Judge Weissman. I was there. Mr. McNair was there. A number of us here were there. He said that he is now head of the church, not Mr. Armstrong. That's what he said, and that he was going to appoint Mr. Cole. And I think he meant it not necessarily in an evil way, but he could see that Wayne was already cooperating so well with him that he was going to appoint Mr. Cole, too. But the Mr. Cole, of course, was to report to him. And then Mr. Cole was very happy and announced that he and the judge were going to lunch together. And he accepted the appointment as the head of the church from this outside man who's not even in the church. And very happily so. And you need to realize, brethren, if you understand anything about our message, which all of us have been preaching all these years, I trust, the gospel of the government of God, the gospel of the kingdom of God, coming from God through Christ, through the apostles, the evangelists, the pastors, right on down, and later on through kings and priests over five cities, over ten cities, and so on. That's our whole message to me. And that was a direct violation of and contradiction of that message, these whole things, this whole thing. So it was all done in a wrong uh, way. And Mr. Armstrong's explained... Uh, some of my notes here. I don't need to go on with that. But they were talking, these men with the plaintiffs, and they wanted to keep the receiver indefinitely. They obviously had this in mind, and Dr. Hay could see that in their conversation, in their own home, Mr. Cole's own home and on this trip, that they wanted to keep the receiver in as long as possible. That would keep Wayne in as the head of the church, you see. And then Dave Annan would have been the business manager, and Mr. Armstrong would have been out or isolated and kind of just in name only over here in Tucson. And brethren, if that had happened, I want to tell you, if that had happened, this church within the next few months would not be God's church. This church would move so far to the left on the holy days and how we observe them, if we observe them then at all, on the Sabbath and how we observe it, if we ended up observing it at all within a few years, on tithing, on every other type of thing like that as a way of life, that it would be unbelievable. It really would become a totally different church. And I believe that with every fiber of my being. And God did not allow that to happen in his mercy. There was a plot, there was a conspiracy. Satan was behind it. He was using these men and their vanity. Some of them came into it a little later than others. Each one of them may not have fully realized what was happening. I understand that in mercy to them. But they allowed that to happen. They allowed themselves to be used. And some of them allowed themselves deliberately to be used for months and months to spread the most rotten and heinous lies about Mr. Armstrong, about Mr. Rader, and to a lesser extent about Mr. McNair and me, and any conservatives that they could find to attack that it is very reprehensible in the sight of God. And I hope that none of you will believe those lies. I've known this man about 30 years, as I say, and I don't believe any of them at all. have no reason to. I've traveled with him here and there and over in Europe, lived in the same hotel room, and uh, this and that, as you all know. And uh, I don't need to go into that anymore. Now, one thing I might say here, too, while we're on this, I'd like to say this much for Mr. Rader. Mr. Rader and I have not been close friends ever. I think I indicated that, and that he uh, had a little upset about my concerns. I was hearing so many rumors, I wondered, well, where you get a hundred rumors, if even two of them are true, you know, it, 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 it concerns you. So over the past several weeks, even before I received this job and some sense, I began to talk because I at least was dean of college and back in a little bit of favor and people would, uh, you know, talk to me. 
And I'd had a lot of friends in the work and in the business office for years. And I began to talk to five or six men around the business office, data processing, who had been some of the top men and administrators to handle the books, including two former business managers, who had been told by Ted Armstrong to check up on San Raider. One of them was did a whole study lasting months on San Raider with our own people and our own figures. They decided to get San Raider. Let's prove that San Raider has done some of these things. Two of these men were actually upset at San Raider to some degree, and they still be, because they've lost their jobs and so on. In, in a personal sense, you know, they're hurt, although one of them had to be very obvious, and I think the other one probably too. I don't have all the facts, but one of them obviously had to be had to be uh, taken care of without question. And it was not Stan Raider's doing, it was just what the man got himself into. But nevertheless, they were hurt. They are not Stan Raider's friends. They are not Stan Raider's buddies by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm from Missouri. Mr. Armstrong will tell you the early stories. I think he saw me coming up and looking at the white sugar in the penthouse one time. He always reminds me of that. But I've had a little bit of that. But I want to use it for a good purpose in this, at this occasion because I think we need to understand Stan Raider comes from a different background from you and me. He comes from a wealthy Beverly Hills background. He comes from a family who was used to money, used to service, and he had a standard of living that was extant before he ever came with this work. You understand? Before he ever came to this work. 